Now at 5.30 on Newswatch. Athens County Commissioner-elect Chris Schmeel reacts to last night's result. Senator Sherrod Brown and challenger Josh Mandel talk about the campaign. And in sports, we will be live from Peden Stadium for Ohio's last home football game of the year. Broadcasting live from WOUB-TV in Athens, this is Newswatch. The Democrats sweep the Athens County elections. Good evening, everyone. I'm Regina Donizetti. And I'm Stephanie Hyatt. The elections leave the incumbent in the sheriff's office, but two new faces sitting in Athens County Commissioner's seats. Incumbent Sheriff Pat Kelly will serve another term after beating Republican Steve Kane with 59% of the votes. Current Athens County Commissioners Larry Payne and Mark Sullivan will be, repla will be replaced by Charlie Adkins and Chris Schmeel, respectively. Democrat Chris Schmeel was running his booth at the Athens Farmers Market today when we caught up with him. Schmeel said he isn't going to wait until January to start his new position. Tomorrow he plans on attending the Regional Planning Commission meeting and a meeting with the Athens Area Arts Commission. Schmeel said being accessible is important for being commissioner and he plans on connecting with the community. I'm going to put my, my whole heart and soul and mind in this job and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to serve our community and I want to get more of us, more of us local people involved in participating and making our world the way we want it. Schmiel said people appreciate him as a fresh voice in politics and he wants the community to feel like they can approach him with questions. The two candidates for Meigs County Prosecutor will have to wait to see who can officially declare victory. Republican candidate Colleen Williams currently leads the race by 115 votes. However, there are still 235 provisional votes that haven't been counted yet, according to the Meigs County Board of Elections. That means independent challenger Patrick Story could still win after those votes are counted in 10 days. In Gallia County, ballot counters are tallying the votes for and against the health district levy by hand after an issue with the electronic counter. Elections officials are saying it takes 10 minutes to count just one ballot. No word yet on when those results will be in. Statewide Ohio officials say the voter turnout for Tuesday's election was just more than 68 percent. That's compared to the 70 percent voter turnout in 2004 and 2008. The Ohio Secretary of State's office reported that about 5.4 million Ohioans cast ballots out of the nearly 8 million registered voters yesterday. There are still more than 324,000 ballots still outstanding. Unofficial numbers from Athens County show voter turnout for Tuesday's election was just more than 55 percent. WOUB's Kara Vickers has been tracking this year's presidential election and how this race panned out among voters in the Southeast Ohio region. Kara joins us from our studio with the report. Thanks, Stephanie. Last night's results showed precisely why Ohio is such a key state in this election. Now, if you look at some of the county by county results, it looks as if Ohio would have gone Republican. But some of these key Democratic population centers are what pushed the state over the edge. It was places like Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati and Dayton and all of the lake counties that just had enough voters to tip the scales. Here in Southeast Ohio, most counties showed a strong Republican turnout, with Athens as the lone Democratic standout. President Obama had a strong showing in Athens, gathering 66% of the vote. Our surrounding counties were all strongly Republican, with Mitt Romney pulling nearly 60% of the votes in counties like Washington and Meigs. What surprised many analysts was the big turnout for third-party candidates like Libertarian Gary Johnson. He won more than a million votes nationwide and just over 1% of swing state Ohio's voters. The race was close down to the wire and with almost all the precincts in, the two major candidates are separated by a margin of just over 100,000 votes. Of course, Ohio wasn't the only swing state key to President Obama securing a second term. If we take a look at the national results, New Hampshire voted strongly for Obama with almost 52% of their votes going towards the president. And it was a key swing state to secure him a second term. But many of the other states saw much tighter races. For example, in Virginia, Obama's margin was only a little over 100,000 votes. North Carolina, though, saw the other side of that coin. It was a swing state that voted Romney, but again, by a very slim margin. Now, if you'll notice, Florida has yet to declare a clear winner. 
they're still waiting on those provisional ballots, but it's looking like it's going to be a close margin toward President Obama. From the WOUB Election Center, I'm Kira Vickers. Thanks, Kira. The last few precincts from Ohio are still getting their final tally, but the overall totals aren't expected to change. Stay with WOUB for the full local coverage wrap-up of Election 2012. We turn now to some of the statewide, statewide races and issues, and we begin with Sherrod Brown, who has won re-election. WOUB's Michael Locklear reports on Ohio's U.S. Senate race. It was one of the most expensive U.S. Senate campaigns in the country. The ads were particularly nasty. I think voters um, will, in a funny sort of way, welcome uh, beer ads, car ads, and detergent ads now. All right, thank you all for being out here. Republican Josh Mandel gave a concession speech last night, vowing to continue the fight. Throughout this campaign, when it was long nights and it was 2 in the morning going to bed or 4 in the morning waking up, uh, we were putting in that sweat uh, because we believed in something. Uh, we believed in something uh, greater than our own self-interest. Uh, we believed uh, in issues that affect regular families around the state and country every day. And we also uh, believed uh, in this great country. Mandel lost by about 5 percent. 45 percent voted for the Republican, while 50 percent voted for Brown. The Democrat will spend six more years in D.C., despite $40 million in outside money spent on campaign ads attacking the senator. Brown says he'd like to reform the way campaigns are financed. So the victory last night was not just for the middle class in Ohio. I think it sends a message nationally that we have to fix these awful kinds of campaign rules and at the same time a message to both sides that if you're going to spend the money here, it's probably not going to work. And if they're trying to spend it against you, you can fight back with a strong middle class message. Michael Locklear, WOUB News. In Southeast Ohio, the two candidates virtually tied with about 111,000 votes each. But Mandel got about 100 votes more in the 14-county region, defined by the Secretary of State's office. You know, it's fascinating that the politicians themselves that were opposed to this um, have said, you're right, there's a problem with the way we drew the lines. So the answer is, we need to sit down. We need to have this discussion. Issue 2 was defeated by a wide margin. That's the proposed constitutional amendment backers claimed would take partisan politics out of the line drawing process for congressional and legislative districts. The pro-Issue 2 group says the time will come for the process to be reformed. Rothenberg says supporters of Issue 2 couldn't raise enough money to combat the campaign against the redistricting proposal. No problems at the polls Tuesday have been reported as a result of lingering power outages following Superstorm Sandy. And First Energy has reported nearly all power has been restored in northeastern Ohio, with fewer than three dozen customers still without electricity this morning. About 1,000 West Virginia homes and businesses are still without power today, though. First Energy expects to restore electricity to most of those customers by late Friday. The U.S. Ambassador to the Vatican is resigning his post to become a professor at an Ohio university. Miguel Diaz has been named a professor of faith and culture at the University of Dayton, according to the U.S. Embassy. Diaz, born in Cuba, previously served as an advisor to President Barack Obama's 2008 campaign. Diaz's term as ambassador has been marked with tension between Obama's support of abortion and core church teaching. Holzer Medical Center in Jackson is using new technology to provide care for individuals with chronic wounds. Coming up, we'll be talking with, the ho with a hospital official to find out more about the new machine. President Barack Obama steps off the campaign trail and back into work, next on Newswatch. There is, I don't think, any other area of medicine where you can take people who literally are at death's door and completely restore their health. It's not so much about the procedure, it's about the emotion of the family. It's about their relationships now. Follow stories of organ transplant through patients and donors, physicians and families in Transplant, a gift for life. The idea of the American dream is that everyone's got an equal opportunity. You just gotta decide to play. We're not that kind of society. 
anymore. The wealthy are getting an enormous percentage of all of the, the gains in the entire economy. Those at the top have done well. They've invested in policies that are favorable to them. Money is being used to buy results. That is the problem. That's how I used money. I know what I was doing. President Barack Obama is already preparing for his second term after his win last night. His re-election comes after a tight race, ending with Republican challenger Mitt Romney's concession early this morning. As Obama steps off the campaign trail, he joins others in Washington to work toward bipartisanship for his next round in office, and that includes having a conversation with his opponent. I look forward to sitting down with Governor Romney to talk about where we can work together to move this country forward. Democratic National Committee Chair Debbie Wasserman Schultz agrees bipartisanship is the only way to move forward on the country's current economic problems. Following the election decision last night, the top Democrat in Congress is already calling for a quick solution to Washington's package of tax increases and spending cuts. This package is a result of Bush-era tax cuts and spending cuts to the Pentagon that could cost a total of $800 billion next year. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid says any solution should include higher taxes for the wealthiest in the country. Economists say if the President and Republicans can't forge a deal, the economy may fall back into a recession. China is also in the midst of naming a new president to lead one of the world's superpower nations. But few outside China know much about him. Xi Jinping is the son of a communist hero, and experts say he touts the communist belief system himself, looking to keep the one-party dictatorship in place. Political experts say he will have to manage the country while it struggles with a widening wealth gap, slowing economy, and ri rising levels of unrest with the United States. California voters want to keep the death penalty. A ballot initiative would have switched the more than 700 death row inmates to life without parole. Supporters say it could have saved the state $130 million a year. California is in the middle of a, of a cash crunch. The state's death penalty has cost Californians $4 billion since 1978. Only 13 inmates have been put to death in those 34 years. Yesterday's vote was close, 53 to 47 percent. A 4.2 magnitude earthquake has struck in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Oregon and California. The U.S. Geological Survey says the quake struck early today, roughly 140 miles west of Gold Beach, Oregon, just north of the California border. The Sheriff's Office in Curry County says there are no immediate reports of shaking or damage. Things were shaking in Guatemala this afternoon, too. A 7.4 magnitude earthquake struck the Pacific coast of the country. It was strong enough to send people running into the streets as far away as Mexico City. At least one death has been reported and eight people have been taken to a nearby hospital. Archaeologists in France have unearthed a nearly complete skeleton of a mammoth. The bones are believed to belong to a creature that roamed the earth at least 50,000 years ago. The skeleton was discovered by accident 30 miles east of Paris at an ancient Roman site. Archaeologists are still trying to figure out how the mammoth died, whether it drowned or was hunted. Medical Center in Jackson has received a new machine that will aid in advancing care for chronic wounds. Director of the Wound Center, Chella Price, joins us now in our studio. Thanks for being here this evening. Thank you. So can you tell us um, what this new machine does exactly? Sure. Um, HBO is actually a medical treatment that increases the amount of oxygen in the patient's blood, allowing the oxygen to pass through the plasma into the wound and actually treat the wound faster. And how does this provide further care for patients with chronic wound disease? Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is actually an essential part of some chronic wound treatments. Um, this allows us to treat patients who may have had a wound for you know, anywhere from four weeks to, to 20 years. So these are the, the non-healing wounds that need that extra care. And how did the um, medical center get this new machine? Um, Holzer Medical Center has actually 
partnership with Hillogix, which is a national wound care company. Um, Hillogix is the actually number one in the nation as far as wound care treatment, and um, they have over 500 facilities nationwide. And when will this uh, chamber be in use? We start seeing patients Tuesday. Okay. And um, with this new machine and the new wound center, it seems as though Holzer is growing and expanding. Um, any other new plans for the near future? Um, yes, we're currently expanding our orthopedic center to include a musculoskeletal um, area. And we're also adding physicians to our Athens location now. Okay. And um, uh, now back to this machine yes. rather quickly. Um, how has the medical center benefited from receiving this machine? Um, it's state of the art, it's um, advanced in wound care. This actually will save um, a lot of patients who maybe had to get amputated, especially for uh, diabetic ulcers, foot care, different things like that. This will allow them to, to actually save, save their, their leg, um, different things. So, you know, basically patients who were unhealed, now we have the, the ability to heal them. So it's, it's a very good thing in our community. And have you told the community about this? Um, um, yes, we have, and we're actually having a open house um, that everyone's invited to. It'll be at the Holzer Medical Center Jackson on Thursday, November 15th from 4 to 6. Okay, well, Ms. Price, thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you. And on Wall Street today, stocks are closing with their worst one-day loss of the year as investors look past the election and focus on big problems ahead in Washington and in Europe. There's a coastal storm making its way along the east coast, strengthening as it moves, bringing with it rain, wind, and snow. Will Ohio see any of this weather? I'll tell you the answer to that after the break. They believed they could face any hardship, weather any storm, but nothing could prepare them for this. From Ken Burns, an epic saga of land scarred, dreams buried, and hopes reborn. The Dust Bowl. Next time on American Masters, folk singer-songwriter Woody Guthrie. I just blowed in and I got them Dust Bowl blues. His journey through America, through the Great Depression, through World War II, turned him into a voice for the people. This land is your land. The music is at the core of what it means to be an American. Woody Guthrie on American Masters. It was a cool day out there today and those temperatures are going to be increasing as we make our way closer to that holiday weekend. Good evening everyone, I'm Brianna DiPolato. Now as we look at that temperature right now, it's a cool 48 degrees, winds are coming from the north at nine miles per hour, excuse me, nine miles per hour. And as we go in later to the day, it's gonna be even, even cooler. As we look at that dew point, we're gonna see that it's only 25 degrees. That's over 20 degrees lower than the 48 degrees that we have right now. And as we see that, that means there's no rain coming into our region. But as we see the temperatures go into our region, we're gonna see high, high amounts of um, strange temperatures. Gonna have the um, southern part of our region at a high of 56 degrees and the northern part of our region at a high of 40 degrees. But that's because we have a cold front reaching its way through Ohio and that cold front will be making its way out of our region tonight. As we look at that almanac, we're gonna see that we had a high today of only about 53 degrees. That's three degrees below our average of 56. We have a low of 31 degrees, which is even lower than our average at 37. The sun set already at 521 p.m. right before our show, and it's going to set even earlier and earlier, especially since we move those clocks ahead. 
As we look at that temperature or at that precipitation tracker tonight, we're going to see that east coast storm making its way inland. See, none of that affects us in southeast Ohio this time. Unfortunately, it's going to affect a lot of New Jersey and New York that Hurricane Sandy already demolished. So as we look into that temperature, we're going to have even cooler temperatures as we go into the overnight at 36 degrees at 9 p.m. But by 3 p.m., we're going to see 30 or excuse me 3 a.m. We're going to see temperatures of 30 degrees. Those clear skies are going to remain throughout the entire night, but that's not the low. The low is 27 degrees reaching about early in the morning. Partly cloudy skies with light winds coming from the north at five miles per hour. As we look at that regional track, we're going to see tonight the temperatures are cool across the board with a low of 22 in Lancaster and the northern part of our region reaching 25 degrees in Steubenville and St. Clairsville. As we look at today's low temperatures, we reached a low of 20 degrees. See that low is going to get even lower throughout the entire night, but those lows will hopefully not be as low as we move throughout the weekend. As we go into tomorrow, that nor'easter, that storm is making its way even more inland, but it will be making its way out by tomorrow night. That's bringing with it snow, rain and wind. That east coast is seeing some high wind warnings and flood watches right now. And as we go into the um, temperatures across tomorrow, we're going to see a high of 52 degrees, sunny skies, calm winds coming from the north at six miles per hour. That sun will remain throughout the entire day. And as we go looking into the region tomorrow, we're going to see sun throughout the entire region with 40s and 50s throughout the entire time. And if we look tomorrow at the highs, or excuse me, the lows, we're seeing that the lows are going up just a little bit. They're a little bit higher than we saw today, reaching lows of only in the 30s. We are, will be seeing 40s throughout the entire weekend, though. As we look at that weekend temperature, um, we're going to see Veterans Day reaching 68 degrees. So temperatures are going to get even, even warmer on Monday, 69 degrees. And those temperatures are going to remain warm throughout the entire next work week, with maybe a little bit of chance of rain coming on Monday. So for tonight, for the game, Pretty chilly. <laughs> a little chilly. You might need to grab that jacket. Right. Okay. Thanks, Brianna. Okay. And well, Keith, football is coming to a close soon, but uh, basketball is is coming up soon. So how are those Bobcats looking? Absolutely. Ohio basketball will be in full force uh, with home openers in exhibition and regular season play. And the Bobcats football team has an important home game of their own tonight. It's senior night, and we expect a stadium full of black shirts. Next on Newswatch. Make Wednesdays your destination for exploration. First, on nature, what can unlikely friendships teach us about animal emotions? Next, Nova attempts to explain how natives of Easter Island moved 82-ton statues. What we're going to do is tricky, and we've never done this before. Then, Nova Science Now asks, what are animals thinking? Uh, oh my gosh! This Wednesday, PBS is your destination for exploration. Celebrate the best of Americana from the Ryman Auditorium with Alabama Shakes, Bonnie Raitt and John Hyatt, Booker T. Jones, Carolina Chocolate Drops, Guy Clark, Hayes Carl with Carrie Ann Hurst, Jason Isbell and the 400 Unit, Richard Thompson, The Mavericks, and me, Jim Lauderdale, as ACL presents Americana Music Festival 2012. Bobcat football fans all over the nation, today is the best day of the week. The 8-1 Cats play host to 6-3 Bowling Green in a nationally televised game that will double as a Bobcat blackout. Reporter Pat Chiesa is live at Peden Stadium to pre preview this matchup. Pat, it sounds like there's a buzz coming from Peden tonight. Well, Keith, to say there's a buzz around this campus just might be an understatement. Take a home team in Ohio which is well on its way to its best, its best start since 1968 and pit them against a road team in Bowling Green, which has won five games in a row heading into tonight's matchup and certainly has revenge on its mind after a heartbreaking loss on their home turf last season. And that is the recipe you have for tonight's matchup. And oh yeah, as if the Bobcats don't have enough to play for, tonight is also senior night for the Green and White. This will be the last game at Peden Stadium for Ohio's senior class, which is the winningest class in Bobcat history. Among the seniors who will be in uniform tonight are defensive linemen Carl Jones, Corey Hastings, and Neil Huen. Their mission is simple, getting to Bowling Green quarterback Matt Schultz and running back Anthon Samuel, who spearheaded a BG offense that's averaging 31.4 points per game over the last five games. 
Ohio's offense, meanwhile, also carries plenty of momentum into this game. After putting up 45 points against Eastern Michigan last week, they'll certainly need all the momentum they can get because BG's defense is good. First in the MAC in every major statistical category, the key for the Cats, I think, will be the play of the offensive line. If they can provide protection for quarterback Tyler Titleton, good things should happen for this Bobcat offense. Now, as far as playoff implications are concerned, both of these teams are currently tied for second in the MAC East behind only Kent State. So needless to say, the loser of this game will be on the outside looking in at the MAC championship picture. Keith, I think uh, it's going to be an electric atmosphere tonight, a must-win game for both teams. This is a game you don't want to miss if you're a Bobcat fan. Well, absolutely, Pat. The Falcons haven't earned the win over the Cats since November 8, 2008, but the last victory was at Peden Stadium. Should be a great game tonight. Thanks, Pat. After a MAC Championship Sweet 16 appearance and every starter returning to the team, there is a lot of hype for the Ohio men's basketball season. With an exhibition win against Mercyhurst under their belt, the Cats look forward to what this season entails. But one area they're looking to improve is rebounding. We're trying to, you know, obviously improve on the things that, uh, that we didn't do so well in the, in the exhibition game. Uh, you know, always starting with defense and rebounding. I think those are two big keys for us. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of that uh, so far, and we're going to continue to do that uh, in preparation for this game on Saturday. Uh, defensively, I think we'll be fine defensively, mm -hmm. except the only thing we have to do is you have to finish off the possess possession by rebounding the ball. And I think that's a part of being a great defensive team is rebounding the ball and not allowing second chance opportunities and things of that nature. This year will be the 40th season for the Ohio women's basketball program. The team looks to begin in, in good fashion tomorrow evening as they host the Wheeling Jesuit Cardinals in exhibition game. The Bobcats return three seniors, Tina Fisher, Ashley Fowler, and Simone Lyles, but have a difficult task of playing without last year's senior leader, Tanisha Benson. Not really looking at it from one particular player, but for our whole team to come together. And I think if we do it as a collective a group, I think we'll be able to match that 15 points and seven rebounds she provided for us. In more college basketball news, the AP and coaches polls have already picked the Indiana Hoosiers as the top team in the nation in men's college basketball. But the Hoosiers will be without two of their players. NCAA ruled that forward Hannah Mascara Pereira and center uh, Peter Jerkin will miss the first nine games of the, first of the season due to illegal benefits. Those benefits included thousands of dollars in plane tickets, meals, and housing, and both players must repay a portion to a charity of their choice. Indiana plans to appeal the length of the suspension and begin play this Friday night as they host Bryant University. Okay. Oh. So it looks like a, a difficult week for OU. A great game, though, this tonight with Bowling Green. A lot of black shirts. I'm very excited. Definitely. I'm sure there are already a, plenty of Bobcat fans out there ready for that blackout game. Thanks, Keith. And stay tuned tonight on WOUB. Here's a look at what's coming up next on your public television station. Taking one last look at that weather, we're going to see a low tonight of 27 degrees, partly cloudy skies, light winds coming from the north at 5 miles per hour. But as we go into tomorrow, we're going to see warmer temperatures than what we saw today, a high of 52 degrees, sunny skies, and calm winds. As we look at that seven-day forecast, we're going to see warmer temperatures throughout the holiday weekend and maybe some rain on that following Monday, but a nice work week overall. All right, thanks, Brianna. You're welcome. And that does it. So, um, looks like good weather this evening. There's nice weather for that game tonight. Maybe a little chilly. You might need to grab a coat. But other than that, we're going to have really nice weather for the Veterans Day weekend. All right. Sounds great. Thanks, Brianna. And that does it for our broadcast on the 7th of November, 2012. Thanks for watching. For Brianna DiPilato, Keith Turner, and Regina Donizetti, I'm Stephanie Hyatt. You can get the latest news and weather on the WOUB radio network, and you can view our program anytime online at WOUB.org. Have a great night.